Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, owner of the company Horns Vodin, and I'm joined today by Carl Farugia. Um, Carl, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about who you are, what you do, what you specialize in, and what we're going to talk about, I guess? Sure. So, so yeah, so as you said, my name is Carl Farugia. I'm, I'm doing a PhD at the University of Oslo at the Department of Linguistics and Nordic Studies. And um, yeah, so I specialize particularly in the uh, relationship between medieval Scandinavia and the Muslim world. Uh, so I did my master's. I worked specifically on the Arabic literature from Spain about Vikings, about the Viking attacks in Spain. And now I'm working on the other way around, essentially. So I'm working on the Norse literature about Muslims and sort of what they thought about Muslims, what was their imagination of Muslims at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I specialize in. Uh, so, yeah, so I thought that today we could speak a bit about more, perhaps, the stuff that I worked with for my master's um, that is more Viking-related, that is uh, mm-hmm. on, in the Viking age, and it relates to Viking raids in, uh, in, in Spain, main, mm-hmm. uh, mainly. So, and yeah, and you... then that gives me excuse also to speak about Arabic sources, uh, which yeah. I don't think a lot of people know too much about. So. Yeah. Absolutely not. You did forget one thing, and that's mm. sport sporter of awesome beard. There's not many oh, yeah. times well, I you. get there's not many times <laughs> I get beard envy, but that's a, that's an impressive one. Yeah, it needs a trim, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, look, it looks good. It suits you. Um yeah, so be- before we, we we touched on the you said you're a Maltese uh, yeah. by birth. And then mm-hmm. that made me ask the question kind of is that what got you into the the Arabic side of, mm. of kind of this, this yeah, whole thing? A, yeah, you know what? It, 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 in a way, it did really because what happened to me when I was doing my bachelor in uh, in London, I did my my BA in, in at UCL in London. Um, we did touch a bit upon some of the Arabic texts, especially Ibn Fadlan, which I think is perhaps the best known Arabic source that we have. From it was a Baghdadi uh, author, Baghdadi traveler who mm-hmm. wrote about Scandinavians, supposedly. Uh, so we we did a bit of that, and which I, at the time, I had no idea existed. Um, and I thought, you know, I speak Maltese, and Maltese is very close to Arabic. I mean, it derives okay. from Arabic. It's a Semitic language like Arabic. So I thought, you know, I might as well use my knowledge of that and learn Arabic. And that's <laughs> from, from there I sort of went into, because I, I thought it would be, perhaps a smaller step for me uh, because yeah. I have the language already. So that is that. And also uh, uh, considering this is referring to, you know, the, the, the Muslim Spain, you know, the, the, when Spain was Muslim um, and Malta at the same time would have been also Muslim at the same, mm-hmm. in the same period of time. So it also relates a bit to a uh, history that I'm familiar with, you know? Yeah. So that's what made me interested as well. It's sort of the clash between, what I was studying and what I'm from, where I'm from rather, or what I am. Um, so yeah. I thought that that's something that I could really get into. So that's how I ended up doing this. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating because you you hear so much about Christianity when it comes to mm. the Viking Age, Scandinavia. Yeah. Christianity is the the focus, like through and through. Even though I think most people who listen to this is, at this point will have heard of Ibn Fadlan. Mm-hmm. But other than outside of that. I don't think we've ever really touched that much on kind of the Islamic side of it yeah. and kind of what they think of each other. And and we know that obviously they had interactions. Sure, absolutely. And that's the thing, you know, I mean, Scandinavia, uh, Scandinavians in this time, they were traveling, they were doing raids, you know, as they did in many other parts of Europe. And uh, yeah, we, we don't really get a lot of scholarship about Spain, in fact, when it comes to the Viking Age. Unfortunately, even with, to be fair, unfortunately, not even with medieval studies in general, there's a bit of a lack of information or, or study of Spain. I think perhaps, I mean, it's just speculation, but perhaps one of the factors that makes it harder for people to tackle Spain is that the history of Spain is rather complicated when it comes to the different cultures and languages being used. Because, you know, mm. a huge part of Spain at this time, for a long period of time, for hundreds of years, was... Arabic speaking essentially was was Muslim was Muslim power Muslim uh, rule at this time in yeah. most of Spain and and a lot of the sources are in Arabic so uh, you know it tends to be perhaps a bit um, understandably enough uh, intimidating to most people who do not have Arabic and we tend to avoid reading stuff in translation um, as scholars we 
tend to prefer doing stuff in the original language because mm-hmm. we know that translations can distort a bit too much. Yeah. Um, so, so it's understandable that maybe people are not as familiar with uh, some of the Arabic sources because people who work with Viking Age generally do not tend to learn no Arabic, which, yeah. which is which is understandable, of course, which is perfectly fine. That's where you come in, I guess. Yeah. So that's where I am. And there's a few others at the moment uh, around Europe <laughs> working with this stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I, I focus specifically on the Spanish stuff uh, compared mm-hmm. to the Arabic sources from the East. So Arabic sources from Baghdad, Damascus, Alexandria, uh, which are also very numerous. Uh, but I tended, I, I uh, decided to work on the perhaps less known uh, Spanish ones. Okay. So... <laughs> As a, as an overall view, I guess, do we know how far they interacted with kind of Islamic states and mm. a, across? Because I'm guessing it was all across kind of like northern Africa, Spain, mm. into like the Middle East. Uh, what 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 extent was it? Because I guess for me, I always just assumed it was like a little, and maybe in one place they they met and had a relationship and traded. I. I, I never really thought it would be that extensive. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, we do have sources in Arabic, for example, well, the ones in Baghdad, um, for example, Ibn Fadlan, you know, for those who know Ibn Fadlan know that they met Arabs and, and, and Arabic speaking people um, in uh, what is the Volga River, right? So along the Volga River in Eastern Europe, essentially, in areas that today would fall under Russia, I believe, geographically. Uh, but we do have stories of them perhaps even going further in. Um, if they actually went to any of these big cities, any of the big Muslim cities at this time, uh, like Baghdad, we don't really know, unfortunately. Uh, but when it comes to Spain, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they raided Sevilla and, and, and you know, they went to Portugal and they crossed the, the Straits of Gibraltar and went into North Africa. At least some sources claim that they did went to North Af- they did go to North Africa. Um, so it's really fascinating, really, because it's, Really far from home, from where they were, you know. I, it's a long way, and that, and, and that was, that's what just got me thinking. How did they? How did they get there? Is it a case of that mm. they went round, or did they use the network of rivers and come through? Yeah. So what is fascinating with these with these raids that we have? So I mean, I could um, give perhaps a short rundown of the attacks in Spain because I think that gives a lot of information. Because. Yeah. Because what is interesting, so there were three waves of raids, at least the, what we know uh, from what we have recorded in the literature. We have three waves of raids that happened in Spain at this time. So there is the first one that happened in 844, uh, 844. And what is fascinating with these texts, and it starts immediately from the first uh, from the first attack, is that we have sources from sort of the trail they took. So when they attacked okay. France, we get Frankish sources detailing the yeah. text in front. And then we get to Spain and we get Northern Spain, which Northern Spain um, never uh, became Muslim, it remained Christian. Uh, the, the, in, at in some point in time would have been the Kingdom of Galicia and Asturias. Uh, those remain Christian. So then we have Latin sources from the North referring to raids just the same yeah. summer. And then they get to Al-Andalus, which was the name used for Muslim Spain. Uh, yeah. And then we get start we, we get sources in Arabic, so we sort of can trace the the path they took by actually following the sources from those places, which is really quite interesting because you, it's, it's kind of uh, building a jigsaw puzzle from these yeah. different sources as they you know uh, raided the coast. Uh, so, so we do know that they went from France essentially, right? So they they went on the coast of France. So we uh, the first uh, attack they went down the Garonne, the Garonne River, and they went to Toulouse. Okay. Uh, and then from there, they went up to uh, Asturias and Galicia in the north of Spain. And then from there, they, and they go down to Lisbon and Sevilla. So as far as we know, they went down as far as Sevilla on the first one. Okay. Um, so Sevilla is on the on the Atlantic coast. Right, right. Yeah. The, the Guadalquivir River. That so effectively, they so effectively, they've come around, around the top of France, and then south, and kind of yes. trace, yeah, to trace yeah. it down as if like the exactly. way you would assume you would go. Exactly. So, so they did the coast of France all around Spain, because of course Spain jutters out of of, of the European 
Yeah. Yeah, so all of France, essentially. Um, and then what is today? Portugal. And then they went around into Sevilla. And then all, supposedly all the way back. Um, uh, what we do have in that case, again, we do have sources, for example, some Frankish annals um, from what is today France uh, referring to these attacks. And uh, some of the sources from northern Spain, there's, for example, the Cronica Sebastianum, the one as it's called, which is a Spanish um, chronicle in, in Latin. But then when we get to Arabic stuff, we get uh, some of the some of the really interesting stuff, I believe, because the uh, Latin sources in this case were quite short. You know, they were quite short what happened. You know, the few lines, the Northmen attacked, in this case, they were called Nordomani or Lodomani for some reason it was destroyed the word into Lodomani. Um and uh and then when it comes to the Arabic sources, we get pages of of, of information. We get all these details of where they attacked and what the Emir uh, at the time would have been Emir, Emir uh, ordered to do and what the army was doing in, in Sevilla to mm-hmm. push back against the attacks. Uh, and we even get this idea that right after the first that right after these attacks. Um, they built up the fortifications of Sevilla. Um, it's because of that. So basically, they were getting these attacks from these mm-hmm. pagan barbarians, yeah. so to say. Yeah. Um, and they built up the uh, the fortifications in Sevilla because of that. Uh, so it was so, it clearly impacted them. You know. Yeah. So do we know why the Latin ones are so short and that the Arabic ones are so long? I I, I guess for me just. As a layperson, could it be the 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 Latin ones are like they're used to this or they know of this happening? Whereas maybe with the Arabic ones, it's not as common, so it's a little bit more unusual and and noteworthy. Yeah, it could be that, or also the fact that you know when you look at the nature of the texts themselves, the Arabic texts, um, the, the, they are a bit longer in sense, like even when it comes to the history of what they're writing about. So in this case, most of them, like, uh, for example, uh, one of the most important uh, sources that we have in, in Arabic is uh, a historian called Ibn Hayyan. So Ibn Hayyan wrote this really interesting book called uh, Kitab al-Muqtabis, it's called. Um, and it is a sort of collection of other sources that he has read. And then he compiled them together to create a history of Al-Andalus up to that okay. point. So this was in the 11th century. Um, Mm -hmm. So we do have earlier sources reported in Ibn Hayyan. And they do, they they tend to be quite longer in terms of these are more uh, histories uh, compared to a lot of the Latin sources that we have from this time were annals. So they were quite short. They were just a a year, uh, the date of what when it happened, and then a, a bit of information. They weren't really long explanations. And then and the Arabic ones tended to be, in this case, tended to be a bit longer, a bit more prosaic, almost. You know, that it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's telling a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas the annals are more, well, this is the information. This is what happened, you know, as many people died, perhaps, or so many ships were observed. And very short and sweet, to be fair. That's, that's got to be great for you, because I imagine there's so many little nuggets of information that lie between the lines. Yeah. It's not just in the facts themselves. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We get a lot of information, um, and and it's really interesting because, of course, uh, when working with the Arabic literature, of course, the focus for them was propping themselves up, as everyone does, of course. Every culture would do that. When they're writing about themselves, they're propping themselves up. They're showing how great they are and how great the caliph or the or the amir was, mm-hmm. uh, depending on the period of time in Spain at this time. Um, and, uh, yeah, when we get to... to um, the second uh, the second wave of attacks, which was a few years after that, it was in 859 to 861, roughly. So it was a bit longer. It was a bit of a longer, far-reaching campaign. Um, and in that case, yeah, they even went into the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, and we do get sources saying that they even attacked this city called Nekor, uh, Nekur, in uh, Morocco. And okay. then in some of the Spanish sources, we get that they also attacked Mallorca and Menorca. Um, yeah. Uh, you know the the Balearic Islands, yeah. and and some of the other sources, some of the Arabic sources as well, and as well as some of the Frankish sources, we get that they stayed in France for a winter, um, 
so they had to stay over because they stayed a bit too long, perhaps. And some sources even say that perhaps they went over into the Byzantine area. So we don't really know where, uh, but the sources say that they went either to Greece, as they mentioned, Greece probably doesn't actually mean Greece, as in like Greek speaking people, Greek yeah. speaking areas. So in this, case, in this time, it would also be in the Byzantine Empire. Um, even the Arabic sources do the same. They, the Arabic sources refer to Byzantines as uh, Romans, actually. You get uh, in the sources, you get Arum, the Romans, yeah. uh, refers to Byzantines at this time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so supposedly they also went over quite long in, into the Mediterranean and stayed there for, it seems like, a year and a half, maybe two summers, um, from what we yeah, know. I, um, I assume the labels are not quite as clear as we have today you know we no. today we we have everything in neat little boxes as sure, far as we sure, can. Sure. But I imagine yeah. back then living in the time it's not as it's not as easy no not at all and in fact you know this was in fact the the whole topic of my master's thesis so uh, so my master's thesis in this case was uh, the a study on the word majus so majus right so so for those who might be familiar with ibn fadlan Ibn Fadlan and other sources in Arabic from, from the Middle East refer to Scandinavians as uh, Arus or Arusiya. So okay. that's what you get in Ibn Fadlan. Uh, so a lot of the sources that come from the East, so from the Eastern Muslim world, essentially, right? So the Middle East and, and uh, Egypt, um, refer to Scandinavians as Arusiya or as Arus. But when it comes to Spanish sources, Without fail, they refer to them as Almajus. Almajus. So it, it's really interesting because we see sort of a bit, a bit of diversity within Arabic, which okay. sometimes, unfortunately, is ignored. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so in, in all of those, they were using this word. And this word has been perhaps misinterpreted, or at least for me, I think this was misinterpreted. And uh, th there is there was a bit of maybe un misunderstanding of what it might have meant. Uh, so that was the topic of my thesis, really going into the term majus and seeing what it means, what it doesn't mean, which is also as important as what it means. Okay. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I was looking into it and um, ended up doing the whole thesis around it. It wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be more about the Arabic sources in Spain. But I got stuck on this one word, and this, all of a sudden I had a hundred pages of it. So yeah, that's that's done. It was done. The thesis, um, <laughs> so, which was fun, which was really interesting. But yeah, so this Majus thing. Um, so unfortunately, so okay, not unfortunate. Let's start from the beginning. So the general idea of what Majus is is that it means fire worshiper. Right? Okay, fire worship. So what happened was that the word Majus was originally used in Arabic for Zoroastrian. So Zoroastrianism is a Persian religion. It still exists to this day. There are still adherents of Zoroastrianism in, in uh, around uh, well, Iran to a certain extent, a lot more in India, as I, I believe, nowadays. Um, but it was a, a, a very important religion at the time, uh, in the pre-Islamic time, especially in Iran, uh, well, Persia at the time. And the term Majus was used to refer to them, right? And it's even in the Quran. Um, uh, so the Quran actually refers to Majus. Yeah, the Majus, um, uh, where it was, it was, the term Majus was used for Zoroastrians, right? And there was um, a bit of association of Zoroastrians with fire worship mm -hmm. uh, in, from an Islamic point of view. The thing is that Zoroastrians use fire a lot. You know, in fact, their temples are called fire temples. Okay. But they, not, they do not worship the fire. It's, it's sort of a, 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 a cleansing uh, symbol oh, yeah. of, of cleansing and a symbol of, of the, the, the one of the gods, one of yeah. the two gods, supposedly. Um, but um, but yeah, so the idea about them from an Islamic point of view was that they, they were fire worshippers. Uh, however, the thing is that it wasn't just fire worship that was associated with them, right? There was a, a sort of a group of of ideas, a group of uh, stereotypes they had about Zoroastrian. Um, mm. That they performed magic, that they uh, that they followed the stars, uh, that they performed incest. You know, the, you know, a lot of these ideas that that come together to yeah. build the stereotype of the um, of the Zoroastrians. And um, so, yeah. So, what happened eventually in Spain was that this term started to be used for more than just Zoroastrians. 
term yeah, be used okay. for a lot of people. It seems that this, the meaning of it expanded quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we, was, we see that happen in, in modern times, and I, I can't yeah. think of an example off the top of my head, but you see where a, a, a word means a specific thing, but then it kind of broadens out to be yeah. usually more derogatory for a, a whole group of people, a bit more widespread and more all-encompassing. No, absolutely. It happens in modern times, but it also happened at the time. You know, in fact, in Arabic, it's even in Arabic, like we don't even have to venture too far off from the topic. In fact, like there's there's a, a word that is used for sort of a, it's quite a derogatory term that was used for foreigners at this time in the, in the medieval period as well in Arabic, which is ajam. Um, and it, it, it has something to do with chewing, right? But it was used for Persians, again. Uh, the Persians seem to have gotten all the brunt of these things. Um, yeah. It was used for Persians because of their language. So the idea is that they were blabbering, right? The idea that they okay. were people with an, an ununderstandable language, which is exactly what barbarian uh, originally meant, right? The idea of barbarian... Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, but you know, even the word barbarian itself, the word barbarian does re- derive from the idea of someone blabbering. It's like a blah, blah, barbar. Uh, that's, and that's where the that's... word barbarian comes from. And then it becomes like uncultured people. Um, and this is the same thing that happened with the word ajam in Arabic, that it expanded to mean, you know, foreign people, like a derogatory mm-hmm. thing for foreign, not us, essentially. Um, so this is the same thing that happened with Majus. It seemed to be expanding and being used for many for many, a lot of other people um and different groups of people and um uh and one of them was Scandinavian. so when the scandinavians were attacking they were given the term majus um the thing is that it is perhaps the best known group of people who were referred to as majus as in the stories about the Scandinavian Majus are the best known ones when it comes to referring to people as Majus. Okay. So what started happening, um, and this is from my point of view, of course, there are people who disagree with me and they'll just find that happens in academia, we can disagree on things. Um, yeah. But from, from my point of view, yeah, it's <laughs> fine. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, um, yeah, so there was this one article that was published in 86 by someone called Arne Melvinger, who wrote an article about al Majus in the Encyclopedia of Islam. So the Encyclopedia of Islam is this, this humongous work uh, where every article, every entry in the Encyclopedia, essentially, is written by a scholar. It's like a, it's like a, a mini uh, academic article. And uh, yeah, in this volume, in 86, there were two entries for Majus, in fact. There was one entry uh, by someone called Moroni, who wrote about the Majus as Zoroastrians, specifically about Zoroastrians, which is the original meaning of the term. And then Arne Melvinger wrote an article about al Majus, with the definite article, sort of the Majus, um, referring exclusively to Scandinavians, to Vikings. Okay. And he suggested that they were called Majus because of fire worship. So his idea was that perhaps they saw them do some cremation and they confused them with Zoroastrian. Uh, so okay. that was the basic idea that he had. I mean, I, I'm, the thing is that from my my perspective, um, he is, I don't agree with him, that's for to say. Yeah. Um, there are a number of holes in the argument that I believe, um, in fact, he acknowledges that there were holes in the argument, uh, but in a very unfortunate way, um, and this is not unusual from the scholarship at the time, unfortunately, uh, so it, it is a bit weird, but uh, mm-hmm. but that's the thing. So in my thesis, then I was looking at a bit of a broader view of Arabic literature from Spain at this time to see how Majus was being used. And yeah. uh, it was used for a large number of other people. So it was mm-hmm. used for like Sub-Saharan Africans, for example, like uh, what, the, what at the time in Arabic they would have called as Sudan, not mm-hmm. modern Sudan, but as Sudan yeah. would have been Sub-Saharan Africa at this time. Um, they were using the term for for um, pre-Christian Franks, for example, were referred to as as Majus. Uh, for English people, they were referred to as Majus. But also, um, in some cases, they were even using Majus to refer to ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. Okay, so, to, so can we draw a comparison to just the word pagan? pagan. Is it? It's just pagan. It's, it's just, just pagan. 
it's just the Arabic word for, for pig and fiction. So that's the thing. So this is this is what gets why, why it's really interesting because it's not really the Arabic word for pagan. It was specifically, it seems to be a specifically an Andalus thing. So the Spanish uh, okay. use of the word. Oh, and this okay. is perhaps what starts getting a bit confusing to a certain extent because, yeah, the word was used to mean Zoroastrians exclusively in the rest of the Islamic world at this time and the rest of the Arabic speaking world, rather. And uh, it was just in Spain that this word was being used a bit differently. Okay. Uh, it was a very specifically an Andalusi thing, but it was being used for a wide range of people. And it does, I think it does mean pagan. And in fact, we do have this wonderful dictionary from the 12th century um, that was written in Toledo in Spain. And this was, this, this was a dictionary from Latin to Arabic wonderful thing it's a, a, a medieval dictionary from from arabic to latin uh, and it was i bet you love it when something like that turns up it's a, I bet it's that's a wonderful just a... piece of work it's, yeah. it's, it's called the glossarium latino arabicum it's known in latin from its first edition in the 19th century uh, as like its first published uh, sc- study of the of the book um but now it's in leiden if i'm not mistaken in the netherlands the manuscript is oh. there mm-hmm. but it is from toledo um in yeah. spain and it was supposedly written by, or it's, it is thought that it was written by a Christian. So at this time, Christians in Spain and this part of Spain would have been speaking Arabic as well. Um, so it was an Arabic speaking country at this time. And yes, the, the Christians and Jews were living there as well. And everyone was speaking Arabic. Um, so it was a dictionary from Latin to Arabic to, for people who are Christian, Arabic speaking Christians rather, who were working with Latin texts. Right. Okay. So they might not have known Latin as much. So yeah. they were using this dictionary to look up a word in Latin that they're reading, and then look up the equivalent in Arabic. Wow. But what is interesting in this case be, uh, is that the word "majus" turns up as a um, as a translation for three words in Latin, and that's "paganus," pagan, yeah, uh, "ethnicus," also pagan, and "gentiles," which is Gentiles, um, which is also used for pagans at this time. Okay. So it is. So in that case, it, 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 to me, it looks pretty clear uh, that it was used for pagans in general, right? And mm-hmm. um, and uh, yeah. So I, I I I don't really subscribe to the idea that it it meant fire worship. Um, yeah. And of course, I mean the idea of this fire worship thing is that you get Ibn Fadlan, right? You get Ibn Fadlan who saw this cremation uh, cremation ritual. In his mm-hmm. in his text, you know the, yeah. all the the detail of the of the cremation ritual, and so the idea is that perhaps these two are are related. Uh, the idea of calling the fire worship was perhaps they they experienced something similar. Perhaps they saw the, the the cremation. Unfortunately, none of the sources that refer to them as majus mention cremation, mm-hmm. and the one that mentions cremation, which is Ibn Fadlan, never calls them majus. Okay, so, so you know. So. <laughs> so so just to clear this up in in my sure. mind, hopefully for. For other people, sure. we have that the, the small area um, the use of the word majus, and it, would that be what is Andalusia today? Is it... e, partially, partially. So Andalusia okay. kept the name, yeah, but now Andalusia is a region, I believe, in Spain. I'm not sure if they call them region. Um, yeah, uh, but it's a part of Spain. But at this time, Andalusia, Al Andalus, rather, was quite large. I mean, they went up. You know, very, uh, very they they took up uh, the majority of Spain at this time. Okay. Um, so all of the south of Spain was was Al Andalus, and it went up. Okay. And of course, the borders was fluctuating over time. Yeah. You know, like mm-hmm. of course, you yeah. know, some people might have heard of the Reconquista, as it's known as sometimes, which is the supposed reconquest of Christians of Christianity okay. into Spain. So there mm, was always sure. a, a lot of a lot of border uh, violence and and attacks and. You know, one side gaining land and then losing it again. So the 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 the, the border was fluctuated quite a lot. A lot of holy um, wars, I imagine. A lot of holy wars. Everyone was uh, doing holy wars yeah. for themselves. At this oh, time. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for <laughs> no, but sure. It's, but it's also, of course, a lot of it was political, and and uh, we do also have ideas of we also have sources of saying that some Christians sided with the uh, with the south with the Arabs with the Arabic. What's necessarily Arab, actually? I need, I need to specify this. Um, I recently saw this really interesting talk by uh, by a scholar in Aarhus, in Denmark, uh, called Tony Sharapem, 
um, who's working a lot with the Eastern texts um, on the Rus. Um, it's really interesting work. And uh, yeah, I agree with her when she makes the point that we should call it the Islamic world, uh, these Islamic texts, because okay. they are Muslim nominally, as in the power would be Muslim, as in the, 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 the ruling group of people. But it doesn't mean that they're necessarily Arabic. Maybe they would speak Arabic, but they're not necessarily Arab people. Uh, the Persians okay. aren't Arab, for example. Uh, you know, a lot of Spain for a large period of time was not ruled by Arabic people, but by Amazigh people, what we call Berbers today, or some people call okay. Berbers, like the North Africans, North African um, native people uh, of, of North Africa. Okay, so for someone completely ignorant, sure. what would con- what would constitute as Arabic or an Arab? Mm. Like, what, I guess again, that's just the. the Ignorance in me, I just assumed that that was kind of like a, an all-encompassing word again. Yeah, yeah. So Arab, I mean, Arab is an ethnic group, right? An okay. Arab, Arabic, Arab is, a, is an ethnic group, which, you know, what comes from like, the Arab, Arabian Peninsula. Um, and yes, okay. I mean, that's where, of course, uh, because of the, the Islamic expansion, very rapid Islamic com- uh, expansion, the a lot of Arab um, powers expanded and ruled over different areas. So for a period of time, um, it was necessary, for example, for someone to be the head of the of the, the region, for example, to be Arab, but even specifically from one tribe of the Arab world. So okay. they were divided into tribes. And the idea was that to be a cal- caliph, for example, to be the caliph, the, the head of the, of the, of the ummah, as it's called, the Muslim world, um, you had to be from the exact same tribe as the Prophet Muhammad. You know, so okay. there were also so the, the, this was a very ethnic. It's an ethnic idea. Like the, the, the uh, being an Arab is is an ethnicity. Um, mm-hmm. But then when it comes to Islam, because it expanded so rapidly as well, um, you know, you get Persians, for example, who are not Arab, and yeah. and um, uh, but also what is today Pakistan, for example, um, mm-hmm. which which okay, which, yeah, so I'm with you, yeah. You know, like Indonesia is Muslim, and of course they're not Arabs. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, but uh, then there's the language Arabic, which was sort of the overarching language of of culture, right? Mm-hmm. In, in, in the Islamic world, of course, it's the language of the Quran, it's the holy language. So that's the sort of overarching um, language of culture and literature. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's okay, why yeah. uh, that's why it, it's a bit. Sometimes it's a bit. Uh, you have to be careful what to say because they're not per- not necessarily Arab. Uh, even mm. though it's in Arabic, uh, and it's not necessarily Muslim either, because we do have sources written by Jews in Arabic, for example. So it's not even referring okay. to someone who is Muslim, but someone yeah. living in an Islamic, Islamic or Islamic uh, area. So okay. it's better to yeah. refer to these texts as Islamic, perhaps, rather than so Muslim or Arab. It's complicated, as we like to say on here. Very complicated. It's very complicated, and of course, it is. It, it tends to be. This is a a, a piece of. Uh, you know, the Muslim world at this time spanned from Spain to India. Um, oh, yeah. It's a very okay. large expanse of land. You know, you yeah. can't just collapse it into one. Uh, it's, it's impossible to collapse into one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's a very wide range and okay. number of cultures. So, yeah. Okay, so we have the the word Majus being used mm-hmm. in, in a one area. And then you said that around Baghdad, and obviously Ibn Fadlan uses the word Rus, Mm-hmm. Um, so are they are they using Rus in the same way the Medus is used as an all encompassing p- term for pagans, or mm-hmm. are they using it specifically about the Scandinavians? And then on the back of that, do they are they then using the word Medus for what? What they, do they know of that word and are they using that for something else? Right. So. Um... So yeah, so the, that's a, a very important point because Majus is not an ethnic term, right? So it's not a term for one ethnicity. Whereas Rus uh, was a term for a specific group of people. So it, it's, mm-hmm. it's an ethnicity. Okay. So, uh, you know, the idea is that Rus are Scandinavians, um, whether the people that um, Ibn Fadlan saw were fully Scandinavian, we don't know. Um, okay. In fact, there's a very interesting study about Ibn Fadlan's text and the Eastern text in general by a scholar in Iceland called Thorish, um, Thorir Jonsson Hroindad, 
um, who suggests that, you know, at this time, at this in this area of the world, especially around the Volga, uh, there was a lot of hybridization. So it is possible that the Rus were perhaps um, hybridized with some other people. So uh, maybe with some of the local people, so maybe some of the Bulhars or some of the Turkic tribes in that, in that region. Uh, so it's hard to pinpoint to see if anything that we see in the in the Ibn Fadlan text is specifically Scandinavian. It, it, you know, we cannot really transpose that and say, well, what happened with Ibn Fadlan, what we see is exactly the same that was happening in Sweden, for example. Uh, we cannot really say that. It could mm -hmm. be that it was, there was more to it, you know, there's some hybridization going on, perhaps. But yeah, Rus seems, it, it is used as, as an ethnic term, whereas Majus is a description. You know, okay. someone, any, someone can be a Majus, uh, whereas Rus is just a group of people. It's, 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 a, it's an ethnic term. So that is the difference. If they knew about the others. So, yeah, so that's interesting because in the East, Majus remained as sort of referring to Zoroastrian. Yeah. So it's closer to sort of almost an ethnic term um, to refer to Zoroastrians. Whereas in in in, in Al Andalus, the term expanded to be a bit more generalized. So someone mm -hmm. can be Majusi, or even in some cases in Arabic, you you would see it a lot as Majus e, rather than Majus, with the i at the end is sort of makes making 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 something an adjective. Okay. So Majusi is someone who is an adjective Majus rather than. But but I don't know why Majusi is just a lovely word. I just like you know that word. He's just you know what? the bit... word Majus. The thing is that it's not even it shouldn't be that foreign to us because it's the same source as the word. It has the same source as the word magic. Okay, it's the same source. So so they both so magic the word magic and magician and all that stuff and in, in, in English, um, it originally derives from a Persian word. So there's a Persian word which is probably magush. It only shows up once in, in Persian literature uh, uh, from the time. There's one inscription in, 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 in Iran, the Behistun inscription that mentions the word Majus, uh, or at least Magush. And it seems to have referred to some sort of priestly function, some sort of priest job at the, the, at the time. Um, but that sort of expanded and, and was picked up in Greek as uh, Ma Magus, Magos, and then into Latin as Magus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, that starts changing over time and over and you know it's, it's they're even mentioned in the um, in the bible you know the, the you know the three kings that, that, yeah. uh, they're actually the three magi which is the plural of magos uh and supposedly they would have been probably from well at least the image of them would have been the image of a persian priest or at least uh, like the their idea that they had about persian um persian um priests or sorcerers or whatever they were thinking what about um, so so what about a mage? Is that yeah. reason, that comes from the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mage, yeah, absolutely. Mage, magus. Because then what happens is that in the Middle Ages, or at least a bit earlier, uh, what started happening with the word uh, magus in Latin, um, they started conflating things. So even early, very early on in Latin, uh, or in Greek even, actually, very early on in Greek, uh, there were two meanings for the word mag mag magos. So again, right. it's very similar to what we're what we um, we're doing now, what we're doing now with with the Majus. The idea of them being either Persian priests or people who perform magic, who perform like uh, you know some sort of uh, what was what have you seen as heretical actually at this time as well, even in Greek time. Um, well, so that, performing yeah. some sort of like magical incantations and stuff like that. And those, then those two seems to have gone back together, and then strange ideas started popping up. So for example. Uh, in medieval texts, and even slightly earlier than medieval, we get ideas that Zoroaster, who was the founder of Zoroastrianism, is also the inventor of magic. Um, okay. So he invented yeah. magic. He invented yeah. sorcery. <laughs> so those two stories, the, the idea of, ma, of of the magi, of the, magu, magu, uh, the, uh, the, the magus in Latin, being both a Zoroastrian priest and the performer of sorcery sort of fell together again. Mm -hmm. So then Zoroaster became the founder of, of, yeah. of sorcery. Um just fascinating stuff, I have to say. Hey, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely locked into this. This is yeah. this is fascinating for me. And then you can you can see the link as well as you're going through 
I can like feel the light bulb turning on as I'm going through it. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Obviously. Um, and obviously we have magicians today. You think of them, you know, doing card tricks, pulling a rabbit out of a hat, all that kind <laughs> yeah, of yeah. stuff. But, you know, I, I assume back in the times we're talking that a magician is, would be seen anybody that's doing sorcery or yeah. something that people don't understand would be seen as maybe unholy and then fit into that kind of pagan Sure. Category. Sure. And that's the thing that, you know, one of the suggestions that I did in my thesis, in fact, of course, it's all speculative. Um, uh, but the idea, well, what I thought is perhaps one of the factors, perhaps, for the expansion of the meaning of the term Majus was specifically the fact that uh, Al Andalus at this time was very, um, was very hybridized, it was a very hybridized, um, hybridized culture. Uh, as in, you know, we have Christians writing in Arabic, and then we have Christians and Jews working in the in the courts, like in the in the in the, the caliph's courts. Um, sometimes it's referred to as convivencia, uh, the uh, this period, so the the, the um, living together in mm-hmm. Spanish, the idea of there being. A, a sort of a multicultural group of people living together peacefully. I mean, it's not always it's peaceful, to be fair. Sometimes that term is a bit overstated. The yeah. uh, the, the sort of uh, um, uh, convivencia. But um, but certainly there were Christians and Jews living in this, uh, there this time and writing in Arabic. So even in, you get Christian literature, for example, we have seen manuscripts of um, Bibles. Right, the, the 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 gospels uh, translated to Arabic that start with uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, which is the first line of the Quran. So mm. this Islamic term was being adopted by Christians because hey, it's the same God at the end of the day. So uh, so it was very hybridized, um, very very hybridized culture. Um, yeah, and it's fascinating as, as the Christian vocabulary was being Islamicized to a certain extent. And this is why it's fascinating to me as well, because it's the same in Maltese. You know, Malta is a very Catholic country, uh, but we speak what is essentially a dialect of Arabic to a certain extent. And we have Islamic terms being used for Christian feasts. You know, so for okay. example, uh, Easter in Maltese is Eid, mm-hmm. which is, yeah. you know, uh, Eid al-Fitr is, 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 uh, is a holiday in, in, in Islam. And the 40 days before Easter, so Advent, uh, not Advent, sorry, Lent, yeah, we call Ramadan, which is Ramadan, essentially. Oh, yeah. so, you know, so so it's this sort of Islamization of the of the vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this time I, you know, Al Andalus was a very hybridized culture. You know, we have even poetry in Arabic, and then the end of the poetry is in Spanish, but written with Arabic characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a fascinating mix of cultures. So I I propose in my thesis that perhaps this this hybridization may have played a bit of a role. In the expansion of the term majus, perhaps mm-hmm. um, to maybe take on some of the ideas that were being that were the term magus was being used in Latin or mago mm-hmm. in Spanish. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I imagine. Is, yeah, I imagine in all the anywhere around where the border is, you're always going to get that kind of blurred line between the two two religions, the two cultures. They're just going to mm-hmm. naturally mix and kind of. Become become their own thing, I guess. Mm. I mean, you probably see yeah. that. No, absolutely. That and anywhere. I think that's the thing. You have to also keep in mind that's you know, as I said, it's 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 important not to collapse the whole Muslim world into one. That's one thing. Mm. Uh, but also these are two different political powers at this time, you know. I mean, yes, of course, there was a lot of uh exchange when it comes to culture, but they were their own cultures at this time as well. Mm. You know, the culture in Spain was you know, different than what was happening yeah. in, in Baghdad. It was ruled by two different, completely different groups of people. You know, the East was being ruled by the Abbasids at this time. And uh, for a long time, it was the Umayyads. And then those coll- that collapsed. And then it was Berbers from North Africa. So it's a completely different culture, even. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what, what are known as Bedouins sometimes, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think that's that's something we, we can... Commas? We can all take a, a moment to to remember as well. I, I say it on here quite often that you know we can't look at Scandinavia in the Viking Age and treat it all exactly the same. No, we you know, it's re- regionally time period is different. Depend, you mm. know, 
it can vary so much depending on where you are. That you know, it's not a, a global society like we are now. So when it comes to the Muslim world, it's even bigger. So sure. you can, even less you can kind of put it all into one box. But I think we all can remember the lesson of the, or we all fall into the trap maybe sometimes of because we don't maybe understand something because maybe they speak in a different language that we don't mm. understand, or maybe they look slightly different or it's mm. a different culture that it's so easy to just go, well, that's all the same. And it, yeah. whether it's, whether it's like, like Asian culture or yeah. Muslim culture, like it can so easily just go, well, I don't really understand this. Uh, I don't understand really, you know, what everyone's saying. I don't, it's not my culture. I don't really get it. So it's all one thing. Yeah. And it's, it's not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And imagine, just like imagine not all that, white countries are the same. It's, yeah, it's, I was going to say, like, again, imagine thinking like, well, Italy and Scotland must be the same because they're both exactly. Christian. Exactly. Yeah, well, that doesn't work with, uh, with, uh, with, with that at all. Uh, of course, that's the, the there's not like, many Italian Indonesia surviving. and Morocco the same. You know, because there's they're both many, Muslim. Completely different. There's not many Italians surviving in Scotland, I'll tell you that. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. No. They're not doing well up there. <laughs> I think they tried it once before and it didn't go too well. <laughs> no, but that's the thing, you know. So when it comes to Viking history as well, when it comes to these Viking attacks, you know, some of these sources are fascinating. Um, we get a lot of information, snippets of information, perhaps, um, that are... Uh, uh, precious, I think. Um, some of this can get a bit questionable as it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but then, for example, you get these snippets of information. For example, there is this one campaign um, that happened um, in the second wave. So we're talking 858, 859, 868, 861. Um, and there's this, um, there is, uh, let me think. No, it was no, it wasn't the final one, sorry. So it was the one in the 10th century, so the 960s, 970s one, so the third wave of attacks. Um, we get this one source saying that um, when they saw the Scandinavians coming to Sevilla, or at least they got, in, they got in some information from Lisbon that they were going to attack. So they attacked Lisbon already, and then someone, some messenger went down to Sevilla and told them, listen, we got attacked in, in Lisbon. They built... Um, they built replicas of Viking ships. The people in Sevilla, they built replicas of Viking ships and put them all along the river going down to Sevilla to lure them in, thinking that their friends went there already, wow. thinking that they were joining up some of their people. Um, unfortunately, we don't get any more information after that. We don't know if it worked. Um, wow, frustrating. Supposedly, supposedly it didn't work because they would have written to it did probably. Uh, yeah. But you get all these like, snippets of, of fascinating pieces of information. Um, so this would have been, yeah, this would have been around the So can we assume um, that they, that they kind of, they, it's not a, a raid and then go home as maybe we see a little bit more of that, like a, around the UK where yeah. the distance is short. It's like, you can rage and get, get your loot, go back home. I mm. assume it's more of a, we're going on, on tour almost of, yeah. we're going to hit bunch of places as, all up yeah one after especially another. the especially the third one right it's the third wave the one in the 10th century because of the thing so we have these three waves the 844 one the one 15 years later in 860 uh, and then the one in 960 to 9, 960s to 970s uh, and you see that the raids become more and more elaborate over time well, yeah. as well so by yeah, the time braver, I guess. Get the yeah, exactly. And by the time you get to the 960s and 970s, that, that uh, campaign that lasted supposedly around three to five years, depending on the source that you're using. Um, and yet, it seems to suggest that perhaps they even had a small settlement somewhere in northern Spain okay, for a yeah. few years where they were using it as sort of like a trampoline almost to attack. Yeah. So they had over time to attack over time because you get these very frequent attacks happening over mm -hmm. time. Uh, over the few years so it is a possibility um uh so yeah so they were yeah they were a bit more organized at this time mm -hmm. and they had the yeah. manpower as well um yeah. you know the sources uh in the last wave we got sources in, in latin i believe from the north saying that they saw 100 chips now of course that might be wow. inflated um we don't know um but you know they are uh, quite 
big, you know, big army possibly. Yeah. It's a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I mean, they seem to have been a bit uh, more successful at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But even in this long, the long one, the long third wave, um, the Andalusis um, were really prepared by this time. So there were a lot of attacks in the beginning, but then by the end of the campaign, they didn't manage. <laughs> they didn't manage so, to so, come in anymore because they were really pushing back. So do you think the waves might have got longer because the first time people were unprepared, so they they kind of attacked and were able to get everything they wanted filled? Because you can a ship can only carry so much. So yeah. they, they filled the ships and then it was like, okay, we're, we're done now, let's go back. But then each yeah. time they came, maybe the defences got stronger, so they're having to spend longer time there and look for yeah. new places that, that weren't ready. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And also, you know, what is happening in Scandinavia as well. Of course, there's more consolidation of power in Scandinavia, which, you know, would require, would, would have more taxes. And with taxes, you can get more army because if you have money to pay an army, you know, it, 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 all, it all comes together to a certain extent. You know, with this consolidation of power, you get stronger armies um, and, and more power. And it's, this seems to be reflected in, uh, in some of the sources that we, that we read in Arabic because it's pretty clear that these attacks become more and more elaborate over time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely. And and um, the thing, I think, you know, especially with the second attack, I think the second attack has captured quite a lot of imagination as well. Um, because there are some sources, especially Latin sources at this time, who um, started mentioning names of some of the Scandinavians. Mm. Um, of who might have been on this on this raid, especially when they went on the second raid, they went up to Spain and stuff, perhaps Italy. Um, but you start getting names, and you know these stories start to expand and expand and expand. So, for example, in some of these cases, you get an idea of um, someone called uh, um, Holstein, Holstein, in in the the attack. And and then another source ends up referring to Bjorn Ironside. Okay. As which is, uh, one which, of which the TV show exactly. took advantage of. Exactly. So so that's the thing. So then they have these ideas, um, which is they, they might be a bit questionable whether Bjorn Ironside was on this was on this uh, raid. Um when you look at all the sources, it seems that this one source that mentions Bjorn Ironside might have been conflating it with some people who attacked. Um, other parts of Europe, and then just put Bjorn in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have one Irish source, quite late, as far as I know, Irish source um, that refers to some of the sons of Ragnall, with, a, with an L at the end, um, okay. going to Spain. And you know these these ideas, of course, I'm I'm getting that that's what was used in this in the series, the idea yeah. of the sons of Ragnar Lodbrok going down to North Africa and 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 you know meeting Arabs there and and going into North Africa. So it seems to be taken out of these sources, mm -hmm. um, perhaps with a bit more uh, yeah. imagination to it, which is which is fine, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, these are the sources that uh, mention those those uh, th those okay. ideas. But but they are mentioned. They're not. It wasn't just completely made up for the show. No, no, they, they are mentioned. There's this idea. Yeah, there's this idea that uh, in some of these sources, there's a couple of Latin sources. Uh, there's one that mentions this house time. Uh, I think it was Dudo, someone called Dudo, uh, who wrote about him. And then this uh, William, uh, William of Jumiesh, um, I think it is, um, who who then mentioned Brian Ironside in this. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, again, when it comes to the historicity of it, uh, it can be a bit questionable. But uh, yeah, so certainly the series seems to have taken from these sources. You know, Some, uh, yeah, a little bit. It's not, complete, not, not out of complete thin air. Uh, well, that, that, that's, that's good to know. Yeah, uh, of course. Okay, be before, we, before we run out of time, I do want to touch on what they thought of each other, what, mm. what the kind of the Muslim Islamic world kind of thought of the Scandinavians and vice versa, vice versa, what they thought of, of them. Because we get the one kind of meme I see pop up all the time on Facebook is this whole idea of the, I think is the, the, the one sort of Christian source in, in, in England of how they comb their hair, they bathed every, 
every week. They were very clean. Sure. You know, they they stole the women and and this kind of idea that the Vikings were this kind of hyper groomed figure <laughs> of the time, very you know, very clean and 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 sure. how yeah, how accurate do you think? First of all, do you think that is? And then what do we can, can we pull what the what yeah. the Muslim sources say about that? Um, so when it comes to the Spanish stuff, we don't get much information. We don't get any 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 ethnographic information, so to say, or sociological information or um, anthropological information at all. We they saw them as attackers. You know, they saw them as as enemies, um, okay. and that's it. But then when it comes to Ibn Fadlan, for example, so Ibn Fadlan is really interesting because he goes the complete opposite way. He says that they are right. the dirtiest of God's creatures. Yeah. Um, complete opposite of what you get in the in the English words. In fact, let me see. I it, might have it, get it, it, long. This, <laughs> this is the argument that I make all the time when I see that meme pop up and I was like, you're cherry picking what you want to look at. And like, because it, sure. it, I guess it, I guess it's this, this nice thing for people who are interested in this today and identify themselves as Vikings as some people like to do for whatever reason. And it's this like, you know, they were these giants, they were clean. The women loved them. They were kind to women. They brushed their hair, all this stuff. But then they only look at that one source and ignore this yeah. one that says they were yeah. the opposite of that. Of course, you have to always, what we have to do, like, like our job essentially is to, you know, look at these texts and, you know, pick every single detail that we can and see the detail of what's happening. And one of the things that we have to do is, of course, we have to look at who is writing the text, for whom is writing the text, what's the audience, what's the purpose, all of these details to really build a picture of what's happening. But when it comes to Ben Fadlan, for example, yes, he mentions that they are the filthiest of God's creatures. But then he lists a number of things that he mentions are the worst things like why are they dirty right okay. so he mentions that uh, and i have it next to me so i, I actually listed down so he does like there's no modesty when it comes to defecating or urinating so they do not wash their hands after going to the bathroom essentially um, okay. and they do not wash themselves uh after intercourse right um and then that they are uh using dirty water so this is this is the main details that they're using and the thing is when you look at it and you think of the fact that Ibn Fadlan was a Muslim. You take it from a Muslim point of view, these are all activities that would make you ritually impure. So for those who might not know, for example, I'm sure that people who have seen uh, Muslims in their vicinity, if like uh, going to prayer, they have to wash their arms and legs, right? There's yeah. usually ablution rooms, they wash their arms and legs before praying. Um, and this is based on the idea that there are certain activities that would require this ablution. So it's in Arabic, in, in Arabic they're called wudu and khuz. They do two different levels of of, of cleanliness, of, of cleaning. Um, and these are activities that make you impure from a Muslim mm -hmm. point of view. So for him, yeah. you know, if they actually are not cleaning their hands after going to the bathroom, from a Muslim's point of view, I mean, that's, absolutely egregious you know this is a I mean, terrible thing that they're doing and especially when like the word that they use wash no, your hands course. smoke after going of to the course. toilet but the thing is but the question is would they have been dirtier than an average person at the time okay right? yeah i mean it, it, he's coming across they're coming across as super filthy in this case because it's coming from the point of view of someone who would see this not only as you know actual hygiene but also from a religious point of view, you know, these yeah. are, they're doing something like uh, almost sacrilegious, you know, yeah. so you have to keep that in mind. And even in Islam, it's important that the water is clean. There's a lot of rules on how clean the water should be when you do the ablution. So for him, seeing them do it in dirty water is mind blowing, you know, mm -hmm. so you have to keep in mind the culture of who is writing um, to understand what's happening. It's yeah. a very important aspect of what we do in the text. So I guess it's all perspective of who's, looking at because to to anglo-saxons they may have come across as extremely clean yeah but then from to a muslim point of view that some things that they do were extremely dirty yeah exactly exactly or maybe they're maybe from an anglo-saxon point of view they are doing a few more steps than they would perhaps okay. maybe that's yeah. why they do that but from a muslim point of view they were doing far fewer steps than they would do um in, uh -huh. in their daily hygiene routine yeah um that's it 
So yeah, so th that's that's the important thing to keep in mind when looking at these texts. You know, we really have to see all the context of the text um, mm. to under to to get the information necessary from it. Uh, okay, okay. So we we know kind of what Ibn Fadlan said of, about the the Vikings or the, mm -hmm. the Scandinavians. And the we and the we don't know so much what the the Spanish. Muslims mm. said about the Scandinavians because it's not really there. Not so much. do we, so roles reverse. Do we know mm. what the Scandinavians are saying about the? I guess on either side, whether it's the eastern or western sure. kind of Muslim areas. So that's the thing. So that's the topic of my doctoral thesis now, and <laughs> that's what I'm working on now. So the thing is, of course, um, we do not have written sources from this period, right? Um, a lot of the written literature that we have from Scandinavia comes post Christianization, right? So it comes uh, much later than the Viking Age, or later. Why than did the Viking you? Age. Why did you pick something that doesn't have written sources? Pick something easy. No. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's the thing. So I'm, I'm working with sources in North and Old Norse um, that are from sort of the 12th, 13th, 14th century. So it's it's okay. after the Viking Age, right? So yeah. a lot of this, a lot of these texts are fundamentally Christian texts. Yeah. Um, so what they thought about them in the Viking Age, we don't really know. I mean, unfortunately, we do, we do have mm -hmm. some references to um, Serkland in some of the runic inscriptions. Serkland is a term that is used um, for the Muslim world um, in, in Old Norse. Um, we do have a few inscriptions in, in Sweden referring to Serkland, uh, of some people dying in Serkland. Um, but other than that, we really don't have much information uh, mm -hmm. from this period, unfortunately. Uh, so all this information that we have about Muslims uh, uh, in the in the Norse record is from the you know when they were thoroughly Christian at this point in time. Um, so that's what I'm working on at the moment is the idea of Islam. But it's it's yeah it's absolutely through the lens of Christian of Christian understanding of Muslims at this time. So they were either seen as heretics um, uh, from a Christian point of view. They yeah. were seen as in some cases they were thought of as, as pagans. Just rather bizarre for us yeah. knowing what to know about Muslims, of course. But uh, when we have sources in, in Old Norse translated from French, from Old French, that refer to Muslims having three gods, you know, which, you know, Islam mm -hmm. is very monotheistic. So, yeah, it, yeah. It, you know, it, it just, it, it's very strange for us to read that. Uh, but it was, a, it, do, was a, it was a thing at the time that they believed. Do you know where that came cases. from? No, I mean the, the thing is that it is possible that what was happening when it came when it came to um, portraying Muslims is that they were portraying them as perhaps their ancient enemies or ancient enemies of of Christianity, sort of redressing Muslims in the 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 clothes of enemies of Christianity that they know. Mm -hmm. So you know they're ancient Christians. The, the early Christians fought against the pagans. That was the ar archetypal enemy for Christianity. So Muslims are the same, right? So yeah. they are they are our they are our enemy now. So we redress them in that in that idea. And mm -hmm. of course, early Christianity um, had the problem of heresy. You know, it was a common thing. And a lot of the the Christian councils, you know, the Council of Nicaea and all that, they were dealing with heretics. So of course, um, you redress Muslims as those ancient enemies that those uh, ancient Christians fought against, so okay. it sort of it sort of, it sort of uh, suggests a continuation, like we are doing the holy work of those saints who yeah. fought against those heretics and pagans. So we're doing this now, right? So mm -hmm. you know we're they're putting themselves as as in the shoes of holy people before them. Mm -hmm. um, so you think of it. This is the period of time. This is the period of the Crusades, right? This yeah. is the period of the crusading, uh, you know, the full on um, crusading activity happening at this time. So. Um, and that everybody wants to the holy them. war, you know, almost, you know. Yeah. So, so it's 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 it seems logical to a certain ex to a certain extent to say, oh, you know, we are as great as Charlemagne, you know, like uh, yeah, we're doing the thing that Charlemagne did before us and that uh, you know Constantine did before us. Mm -hmm. But I think if yeah. everybody wants to attach themselves to a to a big name because it yeah. gives some, oh, yeah. some kind true. of yeah, it legitimizes what you what you're doing, and we see that. Again, probably with the claims of, you know, the sons of Ragnar being there or Ragnar mm. Lothbrok being places, Bjorn being places that, you know, 
they, they they couldn't, especially with Ragnar, you see this popping up play where he's in multiple different places that he could never be in different time periods. That Yeah, 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 so oh, yeah it's, absolutely. It's just people attaching themselves to this legendary figure because it just, yeah. legit, if you like, I was there with Ragnar or like, I followed Ragnar's sons there or I fought with, it just makes, it makes for a better story when you get home. Yeah, and then it gets passed on. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, that's, that's good anachronistic, right? Um, like uh, with some of the work that I'm doing at the moment, the idea of Muhammad being someone called Nicholas. Um, yeah, so uh, according to some yeah. sources in the Latin world, and uh, it shows up in Old North as well, the idea that Muhammad was someone called Nicholas. Uh, but, you know, he's known as Muhammad in the, in, in the Arab world. Uh, and the idea is that he's, re- he's associated with a biblical character, um, yeah. who shows up in the Acts of Apostles. Uh, mm-hmm. But this is like centuries before Muhammad was born. So yeah. there's a lot of anachronism going on. But again, it's it's associating this heresy with a heresy that we know. Yeah. Right? And of course, everything, span, everything comes out of the Bible, right? And this period mm-hmm. of time, you know, the Bible has all the explanations that we need to a certain yeah. extent. You know what I mean? So it sort of emanates from the Bible there. So it makes sense from, from this period of time, like, from their be- point of view. It must be so difficult when you're mixing like religious texts as well. Uh, especially, you know, this is all from so long ago, but then you have like, everybody has their own agenda of trying to put their religion as yeah. the main religion, the top one. So the, everything has like a little spin on it. Yeah. So you have to try and read between the lines and find the, the truth within that and what's yeah. conjecture, what's propaganda yeah. And even internally, you know, that's one of the tenets that's one thing to keep in mind that even religions are internally diverse, you know, yeah. uh, it's not just diversity of different religions, but even internally, religions are, di- are diverse. And this is something that we see even with the with the Arabic text, with the text in Arabic, with the Islamic literature, um, the idea of heresy changes quite often because when even sometimes in the Arab world, when the leader changes or maybe the, the, um, the powers change. The, the different tribe starts starts ruling over an area, over an area. Their idea of Islam might change, might be different than the one mm-hmm. previous. So Absolutely, yeah. it, it happens quite often. Especially in Spain, especially we do have this thing that we have one leader who is persecuting what he calls as heretics. So he mm-hmm. persecutes those people. Well, like they other Muslims, but they are heretics. And then after a few years, this other person comes into power who is from that persecuted group. And he starts persecuting the group of the previous king because yeah. he saw them as heretics. Uh, so yeah, what is orthodoxy and what heresy sort of fluctuates a lot, you know? Yeah. It's very power. It's, it's tied to power. You yeah. Know, religion, really, yeah, religion is obviously a very personal thing. And, and I guess my the only comparison I can think of in modern times would be how Catholicism has viewed homosexuality. Like very mm-hmm. recently... It started the people. The people in these different positions have started to be more lenient towards things, and whether it's forced from popular culture, modern times, it could be. But also, it could be the people at the top are starting to become a little bit more lenient, and you sure. start seeing yeah. this being more accepted. But equally, you could then tomorrow somebody could be appointed in a in a high position that is very against it, and they could be like, "Nope, we're yeah, we we don't believe we, we're at, we've gone back." Yeah, you know, yeah, a hundred years. Yeah, exactly. We're completely against this now. Exactly, and religion, as I said, like especially with, like of course, when we're looking at the medieval period, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to de- de- to the de- to divide um, religion from everything else to a certain yeah. extent. You know, religion was a very central part of of the culture. It's not as we see it today as like religion and power being separated. That's a relatively modern idea. At this mm-hmm. time, you know, it was a just like for a Christian, you know, you know, Christianity is. The truth, you know, that's it's, it's 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 it. You know, the Bible is a historical text, and that's it. Um, yeah. that's that's their point of view of the world. So you cannot really mm-hmm. compare them to the day, as well, because today, of course, we do have this at least this concept of power and religion being separate. Whereas at this period of time, you know, the, the lines are very blurred. Yeah, perfect. Okay, last last question, and then we'll wrap it up, and then we'll jump sure. over and do do a Q and A for for a little bit. Um, so do we know? what the Scandinavians thought of Muslims physically? Because obviously we spoke a little mm. bit about like cleanliness. Do we have any descriptions on that? Is it like 
these guys are fuck. These guys are super clean. We thought we were yeah. clean, but these guys are above everything. Yeah. When it comes to the physical, you know, we don't, don't even in the sources that I'm working with now, right? Because of course, it's, it's we would have to refer to the sources I'm working with now, which is like yeah. uh, post Viking Age, of course. Um, there isn't much. I mean, there are some inform- There's some information about the somatic aspects uh, to a certain extent. There's in like the the the, the description of their skin color for example so mm-hmm. there's there there in some cases not always but in some cases um they are referred to as blauman in, okay. in, in old norse which is which literally means blue man okay um and singular it would be blaumadur which is the uh, mm-hmm. blue man um and that seems to refer to dark skin yeah right it's the idea of a dark skinned person. Mm-hmm. So there's there is there are sources that should refer to some Muslims as Blaumann, um others do not. And it seems like in some sources, for example, when we look with um Heimskringla, for example. So Heimskringla is, is um a collection of sagas of kings, right? Uh, the very important text that we have in Old Norse. Um and in that case we do have um we have texts about uh, some of the attacks on Spain, but as crusaders at this point in time, right? They would be on crusade. So these are Christian kings by this point, uh, going to the Middle East uh, and on the way, because they pass through Spain and the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, they they have attacks on Muslim Spain this time as well. Um, and in those cases, yeah, we do, they do refer to them as heathens. Just yeah. as heathens, you never get any idea of Islam, like it's never mentioned as a religion. Um, but in some cases, yeah, they would have like there are some Blaumann and heathens, or in mm. some other sources they would say Blaumann heathens, as in they are heathens yeah. and Blaumann themselves, right? So yeah, yeah it would refer to people with dark skin. Um, it's a it's a, Blaumann is used uh, quite extensively for that. But of course, you have to keep in mind that. It doesn't always refer to Muslims, Blaumann. Because sometimes okay. the idea of a Blau mother sort of becomes a demonic figure as well, like it, like nothing to do with Muslims at all. In yeah. some cases, those are conflated as well. So you have these, uh, you know, uh, irrational, barbaric people who might also mm-hmm. be referred to Muslims to a certain extent, but not everyone. Um, if they also, in some of the sources, especially when we work with the, as I mentioned earlier, these translated translations from French. Yeah. Um, they're very chivalric. This chivalric literature, right? So, it, even in that case, there's a big difference between the nobility and the norm and the common people in Muslim world. Yeah. So, the nobility, like the noble Muslim, would be essentially the same as the Christian knight. You know, like very chivalric yeah. thing. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it's 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 mixed. It's very mixed. The reviews on them in this case, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. All right, let's let's wrap this up, and then we're going to jump yeah. over and let let the listeners have a chance to um, ask you some questions. So, yeah, if you if you enjoy the show and you want to hear a little bit more, we do do an extra show every week, which is available only on Patreon. The Patreon is literally three pound a month. It's ten p a day. Uh, it's like buying me a cup of coffee every every month, and it helps just keep the lights on. Helps us keep people employed and keep improving the show. So what it is, is you get a Q&A episode where me and Carl are going to sit down and you're going to, the patrons, if you're, if you're watching live, you get the chance to submit your question. And he's going to do his best to answer it. And yeah. on top of that, obviously on the Patreon, we also have the story time episode. We just recorded one earlier with Jonas Lorenzen, where Jonas comes on and we read a story or a saga from Nordic mythology. He does a wonderful job of narrating, doing all the different voices uh, they're always a lot of fun. You get a whole back catalog of those on Patreon as well. So yeah, just take a minute just to pop over to uh, Patreon for slash Nordic Mythology Podcast and you can kind of see everything we're doing on there. And yeah, if you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive, positive review wherever you get your podcast. Um, Carl, do you have anything that you want to plug, shout out, anywhere where people can find you, your work, and? Hmm. So, um, so my master's thesis of the, the stuff that I work, I spoke about today about the Majus, um, is available on academia. So academia.edu. Um, mm-hmm. you don't need to have an account to access that. So if anyone wants I to get more into details, 
I remember when I discovered academia.edu and I was, I was, I was, blo- I was like, what, what is this treasure <laughs> yeah. trove of information? It's incredible. So I would say like, yeah, if someone wants to read my thesis, it's there. Um, otherwise, you know, I don't really use, well, my social media is all private, so I don't yeah. really have uh, public facing social media. That's fine. Um, so, yeah. So uh, I don't really have anything to plug at the moment, and I You're... do not have any conferences planned so far. So. <laughs> You're a man of mystery, which is, yeah. which is, I mean, obviously, as you get further on, hopefully you can come back and talk to us again. This sure. has been I would love to. Fa- fascinating. This is the quietest I've seen the chat in a long time, which always <laughs> means that people are sat listening rather than kind of having their own conversations, having the, you know, little chit chats going on in there. So yeah, people are just, I've obviously been locked into this, which, you know, I know I have, I've been really kind of just, honed in it's been a lot of fun i've learned a lot and i'm sure everybody listening has learned a bunch too so thank you thank you yeah thank you so much like i said we're going to jump over onto the q a and yeah. we'll just let people ask you some questions and then yeah perfect thank you very much everyone mm-hmm.